My goodness. Thank you, William, for those uh, truly beautiful words. Uh, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, and the thought occurs that uh, we're just now looking for uh, uh, an admissions recruiter. And uh, <laughs> if you have any time on your hands, uh, there is work to be done for the University of the South. At least think it over. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here with you this morning. Uh, I bring you greetings from the University of the South, uh, of which uh, this diocese uh, was a founding diocese, one of the 10 dioceses uh, who originally came together in the 1850s to uh, establish the university, uh, and with whom the relationship over 150 years uh, has been strong and enduring. Uh, I'm also pleased to be here as a, as a sometime, part-time parishioner at St. Helena's, uh, where so much, uh, where we have learned so much and have profited so much, Bonnie and I, in the course of our own spiritual journey. Uh, and it is in partial, but only modest repayment of the debt that we owe to the leadership of that parish and to that parish community uh, that brings us here for this conference uh, as well. When a friend first saw the list of speakers for this conference, uh, he was prompted to say to me, oh, look at this list, what, what doesn't belong and why? <laughs> <laughs> I knew the answer. Uh, no, no right reverend he, uh, no theologically educated uh, person uh, he. Uh, and so I'm here to represent the uh, lay portion as well as the academic portion uh, of the community. Uh, proudly, uh, though humbly, uh, and pleased to be able to share with you uh, some of the research that I have done uh, and had the opportunity to present a little over a year ago at St. Helena's uh, as we kicked off what we, we will be more formally kicking off this coming weekend, the 300th anniversary of the founding of the Parish Church of St. Helena. Uh, it is a long, uh, it is a fascinating, uh, and not surprisingly because this is, after all, South Carolina, complex uh, history. Uh, and there are moments in that history which I think are particularly illustrative. Uh, and it is to, to that subject that uh, I would like to turn. But I might also add before beginning uh, this talk that uh, through a providential convergence of circumstances, the observance of the tricentennial at St. Helena's uh, the participation of Bishop Charters uh, in those observances, and the opening convocation of the Advent of the Easter term uh, at the University of the South uh, will allow us to confer an honorary degree upon Bishop Charters at the university next Tuesday morning. Uh, and so we will be delighted. And we will be delighted and honored to have him with us uh, on our campus for that occasion uh, on that day. There's a tablet prominently mounted on the east wall in the parish church of St. Helena. It's placed to the left of the lectern, and it memorializes the service of the Reverend Joseph Rogers Walker, who served as rector of the parish from 1823 to 1878. Think about that. Think about that not just in terms of the longevity of service. Think about the history that man, as well as that parish, experienced. In summarizing his extraordinary tenure, this tablet invokes the Latin epitaph found on the tombstone of Christopher Wren at St. Paul's, London. Si monumentum requires 
Kirkham Speaker Ray, which translated means, of course, if you seek his monument, look around you. There could hardly be a more fitting admonition, a more appropriate memorial. But if there were, it would be the passage from Acts, read at last night's Evensong, which also happens to appear on that memorial tablet. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. <coughs> Joseph Walker left a lasting mark. Through periods of boom and bust, excitement and despair, war and peace, he led his life and his flock according to a simple, constant principle. What good can your cannons do, he asked. They cannot touch the heart. Preach the gospel. That can, and that alone. Walker was a Pennsylvanian, ordained in his native state in 1817, came to Beaufort from Chestertown, Maryland, he was accompanied by his younger brother, Edward, age five, who had also served the Diocese of South Carolina for 54 years. Both brothers married well. Edward wed Anne Barnwell in 1844. Joseph married Mariana Rett in 1830. The young, energetic new rector was of the evangelical persuasion, very much in the tradition of Lewis Jones, who had played so prominent a role during the early years of St. Helena's. Within five years of his arrival in Beaufort, membership in the church had doubled. His influence could be seen everywhere. Worship services on feast days, Wednesday mornings and Friday evenings, as well as on Sunday. Holy Communion on the first Sunday of every month, a children's education program, and a growing library to nurture the parish and the Sunday school. St. Helena's also played a leadership role in the Protestant Episcopal Society for the Advancement of Christianity in South Carolina. And in 1824, the parish contributed what historians have termed a significant amount to the new General Theological Seminary in New York. The decade of the 1820s, as many of you know, brought change to South Carolina and surely affected Beaufort. And we can only begin to understand the impact as well as the effect of this revival by looking at this larger historical context. In the wake of a serious depression that occurred in 1819, the price of cotton plummeted by 57% and didn't fully recover until the early 1850s. The opening of rich new cotton lands to the west drew South Carolinians to the prospect of a fresh start. The 1830 census revealed that during the previous 10 years, 56,000 whites and 30,000 slaves had left the state. This out of a total population of 586,000, a significant decline in population. And so one can't fully begin to comprehend the impact of so wrenching an adjustment to the economy, to social institutions, and to expectations for the future. But one can catch glimpses, the most revealing of which involved the growing tension between the Palmetto State and the federal government over tariff policy. Now, rest assured, I'm not going to uh, deviate from the subject at hand. And I've taught history for enough years to know that the mere mention of certain terms caused the eyes to glaze over, and one of those words is tariff. <laughs> so just briefly, a sentence or two about the tariff, because it mattered at this moment. As the price of cotton declined, the impact of this tax on imports, the tariff, became more pronounced. South Carolinians sold that chief staple, cotton, in a free market 
but bought manufactured goods in a, in a protected market. To Vice President John C. Calhoun and to many other South Carolinians, tariff policy seemed to discriminate against an entire section of the country. So exercised did many of them become, and so frustrated did, so frustrated did they feel over their inability to seek a remedy from what they believed to be a hostile majority that they embraced the doctrine known as state interposition, better known in Calhoun's formulation as, as nullification. Nullification argued that the Constitution was in fact a compact freely entered into by sovereign states who were thus ultimately the arbiters of constitutionality, of the constitutionality of particular federal policies and not unreasonable proposition. When those policies turned out unfairly to discriminate against a state or a group of states or a portion of the population, those states had the right, indeed, Calhoun argued, the duty to interpose themselves, to place themselves between the federal government and the execution of the alleged unconstitutional act. A state could and should nullify such laws and declare them inoperative within a state's boundaries. I tell you this because at the time of the Beaufort Revival in 1831, the crisis over the tariff and the crisis over nullification and the very future of the still fragile and young Union was very much uncertain and very much at risk. By 1830, these differences had placed the Union, in short, on the verge of a crisis. Some far-sighted South Carolinians declared that if left unchecked, a hostile majority could impose its will whenever it chose, and not simply on tariff matters, but on other matters as well. On exactly what other matters became abundantly clear on New Year's Day, 1831, with the publication of the first issue of The Liberator. Edited by William Lloyd Garrison, an outspoken, unco uncompromising advocate for the immediate abolition of slavery, and published in Boston, the liberator reminded embattled Southern planters of how their peculiar institution might someday also be at risk. In his very first issue, Garrison chose to review a publication called Appealed, Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, first published in Boston a year earlier by David Walker, a free black from North Carolina. Walker's words were unambiguous. Brethren, arise, he urged, and strike for your lives and liberties. Now is the day and hour. To white Americans, he added, your destruction is at hand. Despite the effort of postmasters to suppress circulation of the appeal, and even though most Southern slaves were illiterate, the pamphlet found its way south, and its message, if only rarely, got through. One cannot possibly, therefore, understand the momentous events that took place in Beaufort in October of that year, 1831, without grasping this context, which began to be shaped even more fully by the increasingly aggressive abolition movement, and is further made clear to us and more interesting to us by a simple checking of the calendar. On February 12th of that year occurred a total eclipse of the sun, always an omen. <laughs> On July 4th of that year, the death of former President James Monroe, the third former president of the United States to die on the nation's birthday. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had both died on July 4th, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of American independence. Now another former president dies on that same date, another omen. And then on August 22nd, a slave uprising in Southampton County, Virginia, led by the charismatic Nat Turner, which resulted in a two-day rampage of indiscriminate killing of white men, women, and children. Meanwhile, the nullification crisis mounted. On July 26, Calhoun issued his Fort Hill letter, 
acknowledging his authorship while vice president of essays promulgating the doctrine of state interposition. The letter made dire linkages. The tariff Calhoun wrote was simply, in his words, the occasion rather than the real cause of the present unhappy state of things. The truth can no longer be disguised. The peculiar domestic institution of the southern states has placed them in opposite relation to the majority of the Union. In other words, it was all about slavery. That same month, the States Rights and Free Trade Association announced its founding in Charleston. One of its leaders was William J. Grayson of Beaufort and of St. Helena's Parish. Indeed, by this time, as historian Larry Rowland has written, the Beaufort district had become strongly states' rights and pro-nullification. The context. Change and uncertainty, as we all know, are constants in life, but at some times they're more pronounced and oppressive than at other times. Imperfect human beings, imperfectly comprehending the world in which they live and their place in it, find themselves at such moments seeking that which is changeless and abiding. The great revivalist Charles Grandison Finney later wrote that the month of October 1831 began, in his words, the greatest revival of religion throughout the land that this country has ever witnessed. And he continued, the Lord was aiming at the conversion of the highest classes of society. On October 23, 1831, Finney preached a sermon entitled, Sinners Bound to Change Their Own Hearts, in Boston's historic Park Street Church. And at almost the very same moment, the Reverend Daniel Baker arrived in Beaufort. Invited by Joseph Walker, Baker, who was a native of Midway, Georgia, a graduate of Princeton Seminary, and an itinerant Presbyterian evangelist came to address a population buffeted by change and ripe for conversion. Since there was no Presbyterian church in town, Baker delivered his first sermon in a small Methodist mission church, uh, the present Wesley AME Church, for those of you who know, uh, who know Buford. But that building proved too small much too small to contain the crowd that turned out. The only buildings of suitable size were the Baptist and Episcopal churches, and so over the next 10 days, services led by Baker alternated between the two. The historian of the Diocese of South Carolina, the Right Reverend Albert Sidney Thomas, wrote as follows. There were those who, while unaccustomed to such services, trusted their pastors. There were others who looked askance at the innovation and viewed it with rather critical, if not hostile eyes. When the time came, the entire community was in a state of eager expectation. A notice was sent out daily to every house, giving the place an hour at which services were to be held. The crowds grew daily. All ages, all sorts and conditions were touched. The entire community found itself caught up in the moment. The title of this talk is no exaggeration. Buford was on fire. Baker himself described the scene. This is the way he put it. The Episcopal minister was very cordial and offered me the use of his pulpit. Knowing the peculiar views of our Episcopal brethren, <laughs> I proposed standing below, but he insisted upon it that I should go into his pulpit. This I would do after the reading of the Episcopal service. The effect was electrifying, transforming, and the story is best related by eyewitnesses, beginning with Baker. 
Oh, what blessed meetings we had. Three times every day did I preach, and every day and every night to full houses. Besides, it was usual to have what was called a concert of prayer at the going down of the sun. Writing in the Beaufort Gazette, William J. Grayson, himself converted during the revival, reported as follows. The effect no one can conceive who was not present. Politics were forgotten, business stood, stood still, and shops and stores were shut. The schools closed. One subject only appeared to occupy all minds and engross all hearts. The church was filled to overflowing. Seats, galleries, aisles exhibited a dense mass of human beings from hoary age to childhood. When crowds moved forward and fell prostrate at the foot of the altar, and the rich music of hundreds of voices and the solemn accents of prayer rose over the kneeling multitude, it was not in human hearts to resist the influence that awoke its sympathies. The union of sects produced on the occasion was not the least striking feature of the event. Distinctions, Grayson writes, Grayson writes, distinctions were laid aside. Christians of all denominations met and worshiped together indiscriminately in either church, and the cordiality of their mutual attachment was a living commentary on the great precept of their teacher, love one another. An oft-repeated story involves a group of young skeptics, and I'm mindful, Bishop Charters, of your definition of skepticism and those who seem most frequently to express it. These young skeptics gathered regularly to play cards and drink. <laughs> and one of them subsequently noted, advertisements of the revival services stating purpose were passed out from door to door. A member of the card club had one handed to him just as he was leaving home to attend a meeting of the club. Took it with him, showed it to the group in fun. They jeered at it and scorned the idea that they go and break up the meeting, went, and were broken up by Jesus Christ. Eight of the group of 11 came out and confessed Christ. Again, the Reverend Baker. The whole number of persons hopefully converted amounted to about 80, embracing many heads of families and individuals of almost every age from 14 to 86. Many of the converts were young men, eight of whom, the card players, as I have been informed, devoted themselves to the service of God in the sacred office. What did Baker say that so riveted his congregation and so touched their hearts and their souls? And how did he say it? An eyewitness offered this description. There was none of the ranting in his speech of manner, which we had expected. He spoke quietly, but with deep conviction. As I listened, a sense of the rightness of what he was telling me gave me a sense of excitement. It came to me as a glorious revelation that salvation through Jesus Christ was meant for me. Now this may come as a surprise when one thinks of uh, the, the, the stereotypical uh, uh, expectation of revivalist preaching behavior. Uh, and yet what is astonishing, or perhaps less astonishing, about this account of Baker's presentation uh, in the pulpit uh, is that it so closely resembles accounts of another great American preacher from the colonial period, Jonathan Edwards. People who don't know Edwards very well often associate him with what was perhaps his most famous sermon. You know the title and you probably even know some of the lines from it. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And in that sermon he talks about we're as a spider suspended over the flame. 
those who don't know the full story of that sermon assume that Edwards stood in the pulpit and slammed his fist and shouted out to the crowd and exhorted them about being a spider suspended over the plane. That's not the way he delivered. Eyewitness accounts of Edwards say that he kept his eyes focused on the cord of the church bell in the rear of the church and in a voice that was barely audible that his congregation had to strain to hear. You are as a spider suspended over the flames of hell. That was Baker's approach as well. This was not ranting and raving. This was quiet, serious, riveting preaching. And Baker can best be heard in his own words. As I was uh, preparing this talk originally, uh, I stumbled across in the most improbable way uh, a collection uh, written late in his life by Baker himself of the texts of the sermons he delivered. Now, acknowledging, as all historians must, uh, the limitations of what is recalled after having said something, what one said. Uh, nevertheless, there were such recurrent themes in the sermons by Baker that I have to believe what he wrote down toward the end of his life is more than a rough approximation of what he actually said in the pulpit. But uh, on the cover, and it's a paperback of um, these sermons by Baker, is the photograph of a football coach uh, and his football team gathered around him. Uh, and these sermons were republished principally for that purpose. Uh, how, how, how to give uh, an inspirational locker room talk at halftime uh, to get the team to take the field. So if one were to look for these under uh, theology or under church history, well, one would search in vain. Daniel Baker uh, is uh, most readily found uh, in a very different uh, department. But I found this book, and from it I quote, uh, to give you some sense of the flavor of what Baker said during these 10 tumultuous days in Buford. Awake one, awake all. For eternity is nigh, even at the door, and the night cometh when no man can work. Let no one trifle with matters of such high import. The Bible is true, and all its declarations may assuredly be depended upon. The argument for the inspiration of the sacred volume drawn from prophecy is of itself convincing. And the man who is an unbeliever in view of the evidence drawn from this source, would not believe though one rose from the dead. Thus his first message. The Bible is divinely inspired and the source of all truth. And one immutable truth pressed upon these Beaufort auditors is that we all must die. Young man, young man, listen to me. I repeat once more what I've said before. Your Christian mother is right. The Bible is true. And if you die without the repentance which it enjoins and the Savior which it reveals, mark my word, in the great day of judgment, you will wish you had never been born. And now, my dear friends, one and all remember, we must die. We cannot help it. And remember, after death comes judgment, and once lost, lost forever. When death's leaden scepter is laid upon our cold bosoms, no mistakes can be rectified anymore. For as soon as the breath leaves the body, the decree of an immutable God rolls over the shrouded form. The immortal man take care. Great interests are at stake. See to it that you be upon the safe side, for I repeat, once lost, you're lost forever. But, and as we all know, there is, there must be, a but, 
a however. What does the Christian religion do? It sheds abroad a Savior's love in the heart, gives the sweet assurance that our sins are all forgiven for Jesus' sake, that the eternal God is our Father, that heaven is our home, and that if the earthly house of this, our tabernacle, be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal and on high. And the beauty of the thing is this, that when afflictions come and comforts are most needed, then the consolations of religion are strongest and most abundant. For religion teaches every child of God that afflictions are all ordered in mercy and are but the sterner voice of God's parental love. Yes, and in the darkest hour, here speaks the Comforter in God's name saying, Earth has no sorrows that heaven cannot cure. This, my brethren, is certainly a great thing for man in this veil of tears, in this land of trials, troubles, disappointments, sickness, sorrow, and death. And so, for the sinner who confesses and gives his life to Christ, there is a peace that passes all understanding. Again, Baker, I have seen sinners coming to Christ. I've seen them in the day of their conversion. Oh, what a blessed moment. What a glorious change. The soul has new feelings. The heart has new joy. Everything within is pleasant. Everything around is lovely. The sun shines more brightly, the birds sing more sweetly, the flowers are more beautiful, and the grass looks more green. Yes, it is even so. Sometimes the young convert feels as if he had entered into a new world, rejoices with joy unspeakable. And so, the moment of rebirth is at hand. Oh, that this day, he concludes, may be with you the day of decision, the birthday of your precious souls. O oh, come this day and cast in your lot with the people of God. And let us all have one lot, one Jesus, one heaven, one home. And therefore, he wrote in retrospect, a revival is an extraordinary opportunity which must not be allowed to pass so that hearers may be converted and carry forth the good news. Surely then, he writes, a season of revival is a precious season, a golden opportunity afforded for attending to the interests of the undying soul. Do not, I beseech you, do not let such a season pass unimproved. After 10 tumultuous, dramatic, transforming days, the end of October, Daniel Baker, left Buford. Nothing would ever be quite the same again. William J. Grayson wrote in the Buford Gazette, the results of this revival upon the congregation in Buford are as follows. The number of communicants was increased manifold. At the first, bishop, at the first visit of Bishop Bowen to St. Helena's after the meeting, 70, chiefly of the young, the refined, and the wealthy, presented themselves for confirmation sincerely offering their hearts to God. About the same number of whites and very many blacks also joined the Baptist. It is a singular fact, attesting the disinterestedness of the preacher, that out of two or three hundred conversions in Beaufort under Mr. Baker's ministry, not one became a Presbyterian. <laughs> To Grayson, that was a measure of success? Maybe. The Episcopalians and the Baptists reaped the fruit of his labors. Some years later, a South Carolina clergyman noted, it seasoned with its holy savor all the intercourse of society and cast it into the gospel mold and stamped it with its holy features. The world was in the minority. The gospel had a strong majority and asserted its power over the hearts and morals of the community. For 20 years since, there has been a higher moral and religious tone, a more intelligent and consistent profession of Christianity maintained in that little town than in any other which the writer has visited. 
The leaven of that revival has already penetrated the mass of our church in this diocese. It has infused a new life into the episcopacy and awakened a more earnest and evangelical spirit in the hearts of clergy and laity. It has molded much of the doctrinal and ecclesiastical sentiment now prevailing among us and stimulated that missionary feeling which has given our diocese a high place among the warmest friends of missions. In addition, 11 Baptists and 40 Episcopalians eventually entered the ministry, four becoming bishops. Of these, three hold particular interest. One is a man named Richard Fuller, who described his moment of conversion, October 26, 1831, as being overcome by what he called oceans of joy. Fuller would go on to become a leader in the Baptist Church, a founder of the Southern Baptist Convention, and a respected church leader in Beaufort and later in Baltimore. A second, closer to home in many ways, is Stephen Elliott, who was born in Beaufort in 1806, attended both Harvard and South Carolina College, and became an attorney. Elliott returned to Beaufort to practice abandoned the law in the wake of the revival, entered the ministry, and in 1840 became the first bishop of Georgia. A distinguished scholar and preacher, Eliot would later receive honorary degrees from Trinity College, Columbia University, the University of Georgia, and in the 1850s he would become one of the three founding bishops of the University of the South in Sewanee. And a third is William J. Boone, a native of Walterboro and a graduate of South Carolina College. Boone was one of the eight card players who attended the revival on a lark. And he describes his experience in this way. I went again the next night, I did most of, as did most of my whist club comrades. I took the humble confession and experienced the joy of cleaning and acceptance into his love by my Lord and my God. Like Elliot Boone decided to give up the practice of law, he enrolled in the Virginia Seminary, and after his ordination to the priesthood in 1837, applied to the mission board to be sent to China. He set off on a long voyage in July 1837, during which he taught himself the Chinese language in a most unusual way. It was a long voyage. He carried with him the Gospel of Mark, written in both English and phonetically in Chinese. Day after laborious day, he wrestled word by word, character by character, syllable by syllable, to master a new language through scripture. By the time he and his wife arrived in China, he was able to preach to the Chinese in their own tongue. Boone returned to South Carolina in 1843. His wife had died of cholera, and so he left his children with his mother and returned to St. Helena's to speak about his time in China. By this time, the church had undergone a major uh, renovation and enlargement to accommodate the larger number of members brought into the communion by the revival. St. Helena's in 1844 recorded, recorded 171 white and 50 black communicants and another 174 white and 150 black children. Galleries had been added to create space for slaves. Boone's visit to St. Helena's acknowledged a personal spiritual debt, but also the fact that St. Helena's had long supported missionary work and was indeed the largest per capita contributor to that work of any parish in the country. Boone also visited his old friend Bishop Elliot and met and later married Elliot's sister. In 1844, he was elected the first bishop of China. Bishop Elliot preached at Boone's consecration in Philadelphia in the historically propitious month of October, 1844. The Boones arrived in Shanghai to take up their new duties. Under his leadership, over the next 20 years, the Church of Our Savior was built in Shanghai. From it grew two schools, which became St. John's University and St. Mary's Hall, 
one for men, one for women, one for boys, one for girls. And so the 1831 revival spread to the other side of the world with even more interesting connections, as we'll discover in a moment. One other significant result of the revival was a new interest in ministering to slaves. Both Richard Fuller and Joseph Walker responded to this newly discerned need, but they were hardly alone. In 1832, two Methodists, George Moore and John Coburn, began a plantation ministry. They established on the Data Island Plantation, owned by Lewis Reeves Sams, what they called a comfortable house of worship for slaves. They proceeded to do the same on Port Royal Island on the Laurel Bay, on the Laurel Bay Plantation of the Reverend William Hazard Wig Barnwell. At Cuthbert Plantation on Ladies Island, they baptized 39 slaves. Stephen Elliott, the cousin of Bishop Elliott, built a church on the Combe River for slaves. Edward Walker, brother of Joseph Walker, did the same on St. Helena Island. This is remarkable, and these local efforts were mirrored statewide. The Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina drafted in 1837 a catechism to be used by teachers in the religious instruction of persons of color. By 1845, diocesan leaders, including Bufortonians Robert Barnwell Rett and William Wig Barnwell, eventual secessionists, joined to declare in their words, religious instruction of the Negroes is the great duty and in the truest and best sense, the fixed and settled policy of the South. Over time, these efforts created what historian Larry Rowland has described as a distinctly African-American form of evangelical Christianity, a fusion of African music and language with the revivalist message of confession of sin and spiritual rebirth. One can only speculate, and one might well speculate, whether these remarkable efforts had other objects beyond simply the salvation of slave souls in view. That speculation might fix on the thoughts of Bishop Eliot in particular. Eliot believed that the peculiar institution was, in his words, a trust committed to the South by God, which had been forced on a protesting Georgia by the greed of English and New England slave traders. But, he continued, already is Christianity laboring to elevate the being of the Negro population and from year to year, their condition improves, both spiritually and physically. They will soon be our equals as regards morals. And when they become our equals, they can no longer be our slaves. Bishop Eliot. Eliot labored unstintingly to bring Christianity and religious instruction to slaves throughout the Diocese of Georgia. Speculation might be further informed by learning Bishop Eliot's response to the defeat of the Confederacy and the end of slavery in 1865. We have always welcomed them, he said, to our churches and altars. Let us continue the same. We shall lead these people once our servants, but now not servants, but above servants, as brethren beloved, and present them to Christ as our offering of repentance for what we may have failed to fulfill on the part of our trust. But it may be asked, do you regret the abolition of slavery for myself and my race? No, I rather rejoice in it. For at least this one visible, distinguished, and prescient product of the 1831 Beaufort Revival, the conversion experience would lead, ultimately, to emancipation, not only from the bonds of sin, but also from the shackles of slavery. But we'll never know, because gradualism and moderation on the slave question were becoming increasingly difficult. 
But our central topic is the 1831 revival. And to it, in conclusion, I now return. The consequences of this revival would be hard to overstate. It moved hearts, saved souls, transformed the community and the diocese. It reinforced and broadened an impulse to outreach in the name of Christ, to town, to plantation, to foreign parts, and to all the churches where those converted, some 50 in all, would go to serve the rest of the, country, the, rest of the century. It defined, shaped, and directed the remarkable 55-year tenure of Joseph R. Walker as rector at St. Helena's. In so many ways, that monument noted on his memorial tablet began to be erected in October of 1831. To this day it stands firm and enduring. And it continues to touch in altogether unexpected ways. Daniel Baker urged his congregation not to let the season of revival pass unimproved. How could he have known? How could he have known how long that season might last? I close with a personal revealing example. A little over a year ago, Bonnie and I were in California visiting friends of the University of the South. We met a lovely lady named June Chen, widow of Clement Chen. I knew a little something about her history and that of her late husband. Mrs. Chen was American born but of Chinese parentage and grew up in China in the 1930s. Mr. Chen was native Chinese. They had known each other as young school children in Shanghai, but then had gone their separate ways. She left China soon after the Second World War with the support of a bishop in China and an Episcopal priest in the United States. Clement Chen escaped Shanghai on the last plane out in 1949, before China fell to the communists. With $400 pinned to the inside of his undershirt and the promise of a scholarship to the University of the South, he arrived on a foggy, rainy night in August of 1949 as a member of the class of 1953. And amazingly enough, not long after, he was reunited with his childhood friend, June, and they were eventually married. But there's even more to the story. Both had attended St. Mary's Hall in Shanghai. She is a student, and he is a young man punished for his misbehavior by having to study with the girls. <laughs> in the same St. Mary's Hall, that grew out of one of the schools founded by Bishop Boone. And in 1988, Clement Chen, shortly before his death, made a gift to build Chen Hall, the Vice Chancellor's residence at the University of the South, where Bonnie and I now live. From St. Helena's, to China, to Sewanee, to Buford, We've been personally touched and blessed in multiple ways by that extraordinary event in October of 1831. History will always have its might have beens, its roads not taken. At the end of October 1831, Nat Turner was found in hiding, captured. Two weeks later, he was executed. In December, the Virginia legislature began a debate over emancipation of its slaves, an emancipation measure by a very close vote, failed. But lest we end on too depressing a note, let's recall two other occurrences of that year, 1831, one of which is well known, the other of which is not. On July 4th, 1831, America, better known as my country tis of thee, was first performed. How appropriate that its final stanza is still sung weekly during the offertory at St. Helena's. 
yet another connection with our past. And less well known, in that same year, William Bathurst composed a little known hymn whose words nonetheless speak as directly and simply and eloquently to the, to the spirit that suffused that community in October of 1831 and that has lingered down to the present hour. And this is what he wrote. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur or complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness fears no doubt, that bears unmoved the world's dread frown, nor heeds its scornful smile, that seas of trouble cannot drown, nor Satan's arts beguile. A faith that keeps the narrow way till life's last hour is fled, and with a pure and heavenly ray lights up the dying bed. Lord, give me such a faith as this, and then whate'er may come, I'll taste e'en here the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. <laughs>